You said you laughed harder in a Castro dungeon than any time in your life. How can that be? Well, it's kind of easy. <laughs> when you're in a, in a situation like the people that I had as my cellmates, when you're in that situation, you are at the total mercy of the other guy. We had guards in the corridor that could take, decide that, that they were gonna do almost anything to us and we had no way of fighting back. In fact, they had one, one of the guards was uh, called Crazy Horse. And he was a kid from out on the, down on a stick somewhere. And, uh, you know, in the revolution, suddenly they scoop people like him up and gave him a gun and a, and a uniform. And this guy was called Crazy Horse by the other guards because he was wild. And every once in a while, we had this one little window in, in the door, uh, not a window, but a, a gap and, and with bars on it. And uh, he would take his automatic weapon and he would put it through the, through the, the, the uh, door, pointed at us. And, and what would happen is that some of the other guards would say, Crazy Horace, what are you going to do if the Yankees come up, the gringos come up to try to free the prisoners? And he would go, bop, 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 bop. <laughs> and he had a submachine gun pointed out. That's what he was doing that. And he was also quite crazy. And so at that point in the game, it's... Uh, it, 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 it's a place where you would think the last thing in the world you were going to do was laugh, right? But it's not, because we had only one defense. We had only one way of keeping sane, and that was to laugh. Because they, could, they came in night after night. They would come in at 2 o'clock in the morning and take a guy out, and then sometimes never return him. In other words, send him to another prison, anything. And, and so we knew that, that, you know, they may come tonight, they could take anybody, we don't know what, when, nothing about it. And, and, and so uh, the only defense we had was to have fun. And we made everything that we did fun. You know, for example, my contribution was to teach an old Italian game, I think it's called Taco. And in, in the, it's a simple game. You can teach it to somebody in five minutes and, and they're going to be as good as you are at it. And it's very simple. You, you go one, two, three, and two people. And at three, you put out anywhere from zero to five. Right? So you go one, two, three, five. And you call out what you think the total is between the two, two people. So if I put out five and he puts out two, you know, you call out seven. If you think that's going to be it, yeah, call out seven. It's not a very difficult game, obviously. But what we did with that game, we would push all the bunks back as far as we could so there was a little space in the middle and everybody uh, had a, a seat in one, of, in one of the bunks. And then we had the two contestants that were going to have the, the, the bout. And each one of them had a manager. And then we had a referee and an announcer. And the announcer would get up and say, in this corner at 128 pounds from Matanzas, we have Juan Fernandez. And over here we have the, the uh, gringo from the north. And, you know, and, and we would go out in the middle and we do our thing and our, our, our handlers were back of us rubbing our shoulders to get ready for this bout and the, and the whole thing. And that's what we did. And we'd go out and play that game. And, and, and one of the things that was said to me that's been haunting me ever since is that I won the first couple of games because I kind of, you know, was a more acclimated to the game. But after two or three games and everybody's equal and I lost. And they declared a new champion, and I went over to his manager, and I said, you know, I want to get a, I want to get a return bout. And he looked at me, and he said, what do you mean you want a bout with the champion? Who are you? You just come along. You just don't, you don't get a bout with the champion unless you've proven it. You go prove that you got, to, you are Mr. Nobody. 
you are Mr. Nobody. <laughs> you know, to this day, I remember that guy telling me I was Mr. Nobody, and it's really cut down on my ego, something fierce. I've got this almost inferiority complex that, good God, I'm, I'm Mr. <laughs> Mr. Nobody. But no, that's what we did. And they would have dances. And they would do these these local dances, some of the guys, and everybody would, would cheer. We sang a lot, we would sing songs, and sometimes they were funny. They, they had things, I think they call them country songs or something like that, and, and it was like rap, in which they would make up a story as they, as they went along when they sang. And, and my favorite was they made up the story of the North American who was on a hunger strike. Uh, the North American journalist that was on a hunger strike. And, and then at the end, they, they said, well, he, he'll get thinner and thinner until he can get out between the bars of, of the corridor. And, uh, but he'd ha he'll have to leave his head behind. <laughs> and so that's the kind of stuff we did. We, we just laughed all the time. Everything we did, we turned into something you could laugh about. And it drove, you know, the, the, the authorities crazy because they weren't breaking our spirit. The one time they really broke it, and I'm very proud of what I did, at one point they were, they were digging a hole. We had, our water supply was, we had one commode in the back and we had one spigot of a shower, cold water only. That's it. That was where everybody went to the John, and that's where everybody washed up. And and uh, and so in that situation, uh, there was a, they were trying to figure out how to get out, and 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 where the shower cap was, where, where the bottom, there was a a, a petition, to, so you couldn't see from the. Uh, corridor when you looked in you couldn't see anything that was going on in the shower it gave us that little bit of privacy you know and and so uh, they were digging underneath it there was a, a, a wooden cover over the ground under the shower and what they would do is they tip it up and they were digging down they were using forks and 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 knives that they had managed to keep when we were being served and, and I, I guess they didn't even give us knives, they had just forks. And they were taking turns. And we would all, the rest of us would be in the front part of the cell next to, to the corridor, and we would sing. We would sing songs as loud as we could while the guys back there <laughs> are digging away. And then one night after midnight, the door opened and the light in the corridor was turned on to its full. and one of the top officers came in and went directly back to where they were digging. And, it, you know, everybody was terrified, my God. And so they heard a bunch of armed guys, armed to the teeth, came along and they were in the corridor and then they swooped all of us out. And, and uh, we were up against the wall. And by that time, we weren't joking because this was not a, a pretty picture. And, I mean, when you got people with automatic weapons pointed directly at you within a few feet, and they would not hesitate, some of them, to pull the trigger. And so suddenly there was a great hush, and, and, and the morale was weighed down. And the head, head of this little group was calling people over one at a time and telling them to put out their hands and show so that they could look at the fingernails to see who was out there digging you know, put your hands out, turn them over. And so one guy after another was going over there and there was absolute silence. And then it, it was my turn. I had been exempt because when I came in, they said, we're trying to dig out of here, but we don't want you to have anything to do with it because you're gonna get out. You're an American journalist. You're gonna get out of here. And we want you to get out and tell the world our story. And so it would endanger you getting out if you got involved in this. So we don't want you to be involved. We don't want you to see it. We don't want you to know anything about it. Just make believe you never saw anything. That was, that was the concept, right? 
So now when, when we got to me, this guy calls me over there. All right, put out your hand. You know, I didn't speak Spanish, but I could understand what he wanted me to do. So, you know, I put my hands out, and I turned them over, you know, and he's looking at my nails. All right, vamos. And so I said, moment. And I reached down, and we all had shoes with no laces, so you could take them right off. So I said, moment. And I took my shoe off. And I put my foot up so he could check my toenails. And it just broke, it just broke the, the terror. Everybody laughed. The guards laughed more than, the, the only guy in the place that didn't laugh was the captain in charge. He was absolutely livid. You could just see his face. But everybody else laughed. And, and the guys laughed. And it, and it broke the, it broke the terror. And, and I'm kind of proud of that. I think I did a pretty good job of uh, helping to keep us with a happy self.